Thomas Townsend Brown was a leader in the quest to find the link between the electromagnetic and gravitational fields, as first suggested by Albert Einstein. He advanced from theory to practice with the development of solid disks that generated temporary localized gravitational fields. Brown's work became controversial due to its similarity with what is believed to be the propulsion method of some UFOs. And I read that and I thought, oh my God, UFOs? I had just finished writing the definitive biography of one of the most important unheralded scientists of the 20th century, and now I'm going to get into UFOs. Well, against my better judgment, I sent a message to the host of the website, and about a month later, I got an answer back that said, I spoke with Brown's daughter, and she thinks it might be fun. She was his primary research assistant, building prototypes and whatnot in the 1960s. Let me know if you want to pursue it. And that, dear Alice, is how rabbit holes are opened. <laughs> Brown's daughter, Linda, and I spent six very difficult years trying to make sense of her father's life, an experience I have often likened to trying to assemble a jigsaw puzzle when there's no photo on the cover of the box. These days, when I'm asked to provide a summary of Brown's life, I usually start by asking, do you remember the ionic breeze air purifier? <laughs> well, it turns out the ionic breeze air purifier is based on an anomalous electrical effect that Townsend Brown discovered, coincidentally, as a teenager in the 1920s, just like Philo Farnsworth. But there are some who believe that that anomalous electrical effect, when applied in a different manner and with much higher voltages, produces an artificial gravitational field, or what is more commonly called anti-gravity, though Brown himself never particularly cared for that terminology. In other words, there was some evidence that Townsend Brown had found the physical manifestation for what Albert Einstein spent the latter years of his life trying to formulate theoretically, the unified field, inferring some kind of coupling between electromagnetism and gravitation. A few months ago, a YouTube producer named Jesse Michaels did a documentary about Townsend Brown based largely on my book, so I'll share with you now the thumbnail sketch of Brown's life that opened that nearly two-hour documentary. Thomas Townsend Brown was born in Zanesville, Ohio in 1905 to a wealthy family. As a child, he would electrocute the soil with charged rods so worms would come to the surface. True he story. was touted as Zanesville's second Edison by the local papers when he made his first wireless telegraph at 12 years old. And like Edison and Einstein, he did poorly in school, earning mediocre grades in all subjects except physics and history where he effortlessly earned A's. From a young age, Brown dreamed of interstellar travel and alien contact. Paul Shatskin documents an intimate exchange Townsend had on a sailboat with his soon-to-be wife, Josephine. Someday, men will travel in space just as easily as we are sailing now. Great ships will silently push away from Earth, just as easy as the sailboat pushed away from the dock. So after nearly six years of trying to get to the bottom of this strange story, I was kind of forced to the conclusion that Townsend Brown spent one half of his life engaged in some kind of classified military research, and the other half engaged in covert intelligence operations, much of that to cover up the classified military research. That forced me to the conclusion that I was trying to write the biography of a man whose story cannot be told. That untellable story actually begins with the tube that you see the teenage Brown holding in this photo from a newspaper in Los Angeles in about 1924. This is a Coolidge X-ray tube, and we are talking about Townsend Brown today because he noticed that when the tube was suspended in a harness rather than hard-mounted in a chassis, it seemed to lurch in one direction when a voltage was applied. 
As Jesse inferred in the video you just saw, Brown did not fare well in the orthodox academic environment of Caltech. So he continued his studies at Denison University in Granville, Ohio, which among other things was home to one of the finest academic astronomical observatories in the world. And there he found a sympathetic ear in the director of the Swayze Observatory, Dr. Paul Alfred Byfeld, who shared Brown's curiosity about gravitation and Einstein's recently verified theory of general relativity, about which I'll say a little more later. They were both aware of Einstein's ensuing quest to find the unified field, and they wondered how such a theory might be applied in practice. A pivotal exchange took place when Brown asked Byfeld if a coupling did exist, what instrument might it resemble? And without hesitation, Byfeld said, a capacitor. Can you see where I'm going with this now? Just as Philo Farnsworth had used a vacuum tube to harness Einstein's photoelectric effect, Byfeld and mostly Townsend Brown proposed to use a capacitor to harness general relativity. In its basic configuration, a capacitor is a device that can store an electric charge. But it's really the unheralded workhorse of all electronic circuits. Among the capacitor's many functions are storing, filtering, timing, coupling, decoupling, single processing, and Byfeld and Brown would have us believe generating an artificial gravitational field. Once again, I'll let Jesse Michaels explain it all for you. The Byfield-Brown effect is an anomalous physics principle at the heart of this story, and it also invites the most controversy. The basic experiment involves placing a neutral insulator, or dielectric, between two metal plates, one positively charged and the other negative. For greater thrust, the positive plate should be smaller than the negative plate. So the whole system is called an asymmetric capacitor because of the different plate sizes. When a high direct current in the megavolt range is applied to the system, the negative plate starts to chase the positive plate. This happens even if the positive plate is placed skywards. In other words, the negative to positive thrust seems to beat gravity. By 1929, Brown was writing about what he could do with the Byfeld-Brown effect. He called the coupling effect electrogravitics, and the devices he built he called gravitators. In 1930, Brown joined the Navy. And by 1932, he was developing projects for the Naval Research Labs, not the least among them a marine propulsion system that sounds strangely like something that Tom Clancy later used as the pivotal plot device in a movie called The Hunt for Red October. But again, I digress. Brown was still working with the NRL in 1933 when he was recruited to join a marine expedition to the Caribbean sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution aboard this large private vessel owned by Eldridge Reeves Johnson. Johnson was the founder of the Victor Talking Machines Company and one of the richest men in the world. Now, anybody who's familiar with a hoax called the Philadelphia Experiment will make note of the name Eldridge. But you are not going there today or ever if I have anything to say about it. But this is where the Townsend Brown story starts getting really weird. Because according to my sources, it was during this voyage that Townsend Brown was recruited into a private intelligence cartel that Eldridge Reeves Johnson formed with William S. Stevenson, who was the man that Winston Churchill later tapped to form all the Allied intelligence operations during World War II and was given by Churchill the code name Intrepid. Brown continued to serve the Navy with distinction until his abrupt resignation in 1942, which has never been thoroughly explained. But within weeks, this highly skilled, newly minted civilian was driving across the country to Burbank, California, 
where he went to work at the Vega Aircraft Division of Lockheed, in literal, a place that was literally covered with a canopy of camouflage and fake palm trees. And it's worth noting that the Vega Division of Lockheed was actually the precursor to Lockheed's famous skunk works. So we have kind of arrived at the point in the Townsend Brown story where we can pull back the curtain and, oh, damn, it's still black. <laughs> Long story short, Townsend Brown starts showing up in the mid-50s experimenting with flying saucers. His story at this point becomes a tangled web of unorthodox science and deliberate misdirection, a concerted effort to test his own controversial ideas while simultaneously trying to throw others off the trail. It's about this time that the whole idea of anti-gravity starts to get traction in both the scientific and popular press. Gravity was a hot topic in the 1950s, not only among aerospace companies, but in academia as well. In 1957, physicists from all over the world gathered not far from here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, for the Conference on the Role of Gravitation in Physics. The conference has been described as a pivotal event in the history of gravitational physics and was instrumental in initiating the search for gravitational waves. It also initiated the quest for quantum gravity, and according to some accounts, also planted the seed for what later became string theory. One of the sponsors of the Chapel Hill Conference was an industrialist from nearby Winston-Salem, Agnew Bonson, who heard about Townsend Brown at the conference in Chapel Hill and invited him to experiment at his private laboratory in Winston-Salem. So what became of all that interest in gravity and anti-gravity in the 1950s? We're going to ask a man named Hal Putoff, a man who had his fingers in so many pies over the last six decades, I wish he'd open a bakery. Uh, there, there's a famous uh, series came out in Miami Herald and other newspapers in um, probably the 50s. The author was Talbert. And he did a series where he found out that a number of aerospace engineering companies were suddenly interested in anti-gravity. It all sort of quieted down. And I could take two implications of that, and that is it quieted down because nobody ever got anywhere, or it quieted it down because they did get somewhere and it went black. All right. What I've shared with you up to this point are sort of the thumbnail sketch summaries of the two stories that I have been focused on for pretty much my adult life. Now I'm going to attempt to tie those two stories into... Oh, wrong button. There we go. That last scene in Back to the Future. About an hour into that YouTube documentary I showed you pieces of about Townsend Brown, Jesse Michaels addresses the same themes that I've been pondering for all these years and touches briefly on the coincidence of Doc Brown's name. Don't blink or you'll miss it. Was Hollywood dropping some breadcrumbs and naming the wacky scientist in the movie Doc Brown? His flux capacitor makes See time it? travel possible. Brown. Back to the 50s, the moment physics went astray. What? What Jesse's alluding to here is a recurring theme that theoretical physics has reached some kind of an impasse after World War II, and that while countless new gadgets, gimcracks, and gizmos have been introduced into the world, there really have not been the kind of epic breakthroughs that Einstein and others brought to the world over a hundred years ago. So stay with me now, because now I'm going out on the metaphysical limb to introduce what I call my theory of the missing fourths. We're going to look at a pair of potential breakthroughs that have not happened since the end of World War II and see how these two ideas, still relegated to the realm of science fiction, pull a common thread through Philo Farnsworth, Townsend Brown, Marty McFly, and Doc Brown. <laughs> 